guys. Um, so this is a big honor for me to be here in a bunch of ways, um, including speaking with Liz and also at this great museum and sort of learning about the history of it. So um, I am, my name is Caledonia Curry and I'm, I began as a painter um, and a printmaker. And so the path, I'm just gonna kind of describe one of my projects and describe a little bit of the path that I took to be an artist who also works with building projects. I was saying to Liz earlier at dinner, it's sometimes intimidating to be with somebody who's a trained architect, a Harvard trained, you know, really been deep into these questions of urban planning. Um, and here I am somebody who really very naively stumbled into almost everything that I'm doing and I like the phrase walking and asking, you know, kind of learning as you go along. And so um, I'll consider tonight one of the pieces of my learning. Um, so I, like I said, um, come from a, a pretty small town and I was a printmaker and I moved to New York City and I had a very, very kind of specific idea about what art could be because I grew up for the internet. So it was like a square with oil paint on it at the end. Um, and then I got to New York City and I was just remembering that I went to, does, has anyone been to PS1? Back in the 90s, I went to this repurposed old school um, called PS1 that was turned into a kind of a radical museum. And I remember this moment of seeing this kind of stuff in the corner on the floor and learning that this was Richard Serra and that this was his sculpture made with molten steel. Um, and it was just one of the thousand moments that happened the first year that I got to New York where I was like, wait, that's a sculpture? You know, and, and riding the trains and seeing the graffiti on the walls and in the tunnels and going, oh wait, this is painting, this is art, this is the city. Um, and then another trip to PS1, uh, I found the work of an artist named Gordon Mata Clark. Is anyone familiar with his work? Um, he is a sculptor who, I, I remember just walking into this room and, and seeing these little tiny placards on the wall and it's, it was describing what he was gonna do for this project. He said, we're gonna cut out sections of the building that's already slated for demolition. We're gonna sneak in, cut out sections of the building and then when the, we're gonna do the last step is gonna be to take the outside wall of the building off so that the police don't see all the work that we've done until the last minute and reveal this kind of sculpture. And again, I was like, what is this? What is this illegal, illicit, temporary, on the city? How is this a sculpture? And phew, mind blown. Um, and so I just was thinking constantly at that point about cities and about the fact that I was so in love with the city that I had just moved to and that I was beginning to see cities as kind of one of the greatest works of art I'd ever encountered. The way that sometimes by design, more often by just kind of the accretion of, you know, so much history, so many intentions, so much design, development, um, that cities become this kind of incredible organism. And so I felt increasingly drawn to making something that would be um, inextricably a part of the city. <clears throat> and I started with these really ugly little collages. And people asked where I got my name, and it was that at a certain point in making this work on the, on the city, a friend of mine had a dream, and I took the name Swoon from the dream. Um, and I knew this work was really ugly and weird, and it didn't make sense. But the thing that happened is that my whole life as an artist, I had been kind of learning from old masters and imitating, and all of a sudden, I felt magnetized on a path that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know why I was doing it. It was illegal. It was was sort of stressful, but I knew that I was on my own path for the first time, and so I just kept going. Um, and I spent a bunch of years kind of working, and this is actually the body of work that carries me through today, working on these series of portraits that occupy city walls um, and that become part of buildings, and then they decay and they fade away. Um, and then also kind of in this process of making things that were integrally part of the city, I started to make installations. And the installations, again, I found myself kind of reflecting the built environment, but in an interior space. And really thinking about the psychology of cities and the way that homes and the way that buildings and the way that the layout of city streets are so much um, I don't know, they kind of, they can stand in for parts of our unconscious or our unconscious kind of builds them in certain ways. and. So I was trying to kind of create these spaces and these situations whereby I kind of felt like I was inviting people into my brain or into my dreaming mind, but via the creation of these often um, kind of urban seeming spaces. Um, and that's another project that has carried me through the last uh, many years and that, that also then kind of translates directly into the building work. Um, 
like doing these, this, this, this project, which is a, a series of rafts that some friends of mine and I built, and we took them on waterways on the Mississippi River, um, on the Adriatic in Venice, and uh, on the Hudson River. And for me, this particular iteration in Venice was very much about this dialogue between these rafts and the city of Venice. But the thing that I learned on this project was that my group of friends and I, my artistic community and I, were really learning how to move mountains. We were learning how to never take no for an answer. We were learning how to do totally, totally ridiculous things that people said you couldn't do. And we were like, oh no, wait, this is the how, and this is how, you know, this is the this is the fundraising tool, and this is the right kind of set of tools, and this is the way to not take no for an answer, and all these things. And so I started to ask myself, you know, we've put this much into this kind of wondrous temporary moment, is there a way that we could use all of this creativity to respond to a moment of crisis? And I was sort of asking myself that question when I stumbled upon the work of someone named Michael Reynolds. Um, is anyone familiar with the Earth Ships and Taos? So the thing about him that really blew my mind is that he was a person who was just pushing for architectural experimentation in a really big way, um, and even lobbying in Congress for us to have a space to be able to try out different things. And so he was somebody who was really uh, influential. And then I also was thinking about, I wanted to build a temple out of clay and then fire it. Um, and when sort of researching it, whether or not that was possible, I stumbled upon the work of an, of an Iranian-born architect named Nader Khalili, who had been a kind of a skyscraper architect and then who spent the last 20 years of his life um, trying to address the question of, of housing um, worldwide. And so at the time that I was kind of seeping myself in the practices of these people, um, the earthquake struck in Haiti. And I think even to this day, we really haven't seen a disaster of this magnitude in a while, especially with someone who was such a close neighbor. I mean, somebody who grew up in Florida, Haiti is 500 miles off the coast. And to just witness that happening, um, I got together with a group of friends of mine and I said, okay, like maybe this is a moment that we try to take what we've learned and see if we can be of use. Um, and so we met a small village in the in the mountains outside of Leogan. Leogan was the epicenter of the earthquake. And we, we were a small group of people, and so we had this idea that we wanted to connect with another small group of people. And we met uh, a, a group of people called the Mango Growers Association who were self-organizing in this town called Komye. And we said, hey, we've, we've taught ourselves this particular style of building. We're wondering if you would be interested. And the thing that everyone said when we were sort of learning post-earthquake was that was that if you're going to be working in uh, an unusual style, that you cannot build a house first. They were like, even post-disaster, nobody wants to be the person with the weird house. Like, you have to do something collective. You have to do it together. People have to get their hands on it, feel it, make it, experience it, and then decide whether or not it's appropriate to, to live in. Um, and so we had learned this technique, which was about um, using avail locally available resources, and it had been designed and engineered by the architect Nader Khalili to make these structures that are incredibly, incredibly resistant to earthquakes, tornadoes, floods, fires, and they're made out of using 90% dirt and 10% cement with the addition of a few other locally available materials. And so we did some research, found that these materials were available um, in Haiti, and then we worked together with uh, the group in Comie to, to build this. Ooh. I'm taking too long to build this structure together. So I'm going to go quickly through some slides. Um, this has been an adventure that has has gone on for the last um, six years. So, as I said, you know, we started as this kind of very initial response, like, okay, there's been an earthquake. We're a small group of people. Like, let's see about connecting to to just be kind of post disaster. And what we found is that when you work one small group of people to another, you build a lot of bonds and you have a lot of relationships happen. And there's a lot of love happens. And so we really had a strong desire to keep building. Um, um, and so we've been applying to different grants and things and slowly, slowly um, have continued building structures um, with this village. And the hurricane just happened and we're continuing to work. Um, and we're going to be hopefully building a bamboo house in the spring. And so each of the structures has been a process where, you know, we started with this kind of initial idea and then have continued to kind of develop. So each building we kind of get together and say, okay, what worked, what didn't. Um, and there's, you know, so many different considerations of locally available materials, of expense, of what it feels like to live in, 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 in different kinds of structures. Um, and so as somebody who wasn't trained as an architect, 
architect, but who is working with different architects and engineers along the way. Um, it's been an incredible learning process, and this is the inside of a super Adobe home. Um, very as as artists, it's there's a lot of craftsmen and artists in the area, um, sculptors and stone carvers, and so we've we've really worked with a lot of those people. And this the community center, the original idea when people said yes, we want a community center, they said that uh, there's a real need for adult literacy classes because the older generation, their grandkids have learned to to read and write, but the, a lot of the older generation hasn't, and so they take literacy classes, but they shut the windows, and so it's very hot inside. And they were like, can you build a structure? with windows up high so the light comes in so the grandparents can shut the windows and feel privacy while they're learning to read and write so their grandkids aren't going, hey, look, grandma's learning to write her name. And so this is the adult literacy class that happened, that reformed um, after the community center was built. So there's a lot of kind of moments of real joy. And we've also started an after-school program. I'm just going to kind of, oh, I can't, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, it, there's been we kind of needed to pause um, after the after the third home because we uh, it's just harder and harder to fundraise and so we kind of were like well we want to keep building but let's take a break and so in the meantime we started an after school program and we have been working with teachers locally and with teachers from abroad to kind of connect and do all different kinds of fun and funny programming. Um, and the the thing that's happening now is that the after school program does a lot of work with local artists teaching kids crafts and arts lessons, but also when we are guest teachers at the after school program, we do um, sections on architecture and on neighborhood neighborhood planning and building. And uh, and so the, the next house that we hope to build in the spring, we hope to make it a collaboration with the after school program so that we're kind of just like having the sort of play and the shadow of work happening where the kids are, are kind of learning from the building process every step of the way. Um, and like I said, there's People are having a lot of interest in bamboo right now. Um, the group that we work with is a group of farmers and they have a plan to plant bamboo in the hillsides to stop erosion. Um, and so here's a meeting where we kind of got together. We showed some of what we had learned about bamboo. People talked about their interest around bamboo. And this is the next woman who was chosen by the by the community to have the next house built. And here we are in you know, meetings and sort of going through the whole process of trying to understand um, just what comes next. Um, so I think I'm actually done. I raced through, but uh, I got it. So I'll let that be it for now. Thanks, guys, for, uh, for listening. Yeah.